At this time, we're going to invite Brother John to come and bring the word to us. chapter 15, 12 through 20. As we prepare to do that, I want to open up with some thoughts at the beginning of our message tonight. The great reformer, Martin Luther, suffered from fits of depression found in this study that C.H. Spurton also uh, suffered from depression. One day, Martin Luther's wife walked into his room where he was studying were completely wearing black and he asked her what she was doing. She says, I'm mourning the death of God. Luther said, what? She said, you walk around here for days talking and acting like God doesn't exist or that he's dead. So I just decided to join you. So I'm mourning over the death of God. From that day on, Martin Luther determined that he would talk and act like God Almighty was alive and active. We are really no different than Martin Luther. I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard, yeah, but, or what if. And not just from sinners, from Christians. Did you know that Paul the Apostle said, what if? He said it seven times in 1 Corinthians 15, one of the most important and oft-quoted passages of scripture in all of the Bible, especially the New Testament, is found in 1 Corinthians, the statement, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. Isn't that great? But just a few verses before this, Paul is going around saying, what if? Well, let's take a look at these. Reading 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 12, you'll see the word if show up several times. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is is also empty. Verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise. Verse 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men the most pitiable. Verse 20, he turns it all around and says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have falling asleep. You're familiar with that term, I trust, falling asleep. And the King James in these translations is those that have passed away, is what he's saying. The first what if is found in verse 12. Jesus' resurrection does not apply to us. Number two, what if, in verse 13 and 16, the same statement, we don't rise from the dead means Jesus didn't rise either. Number three, what if, verse 14, your faith in the resurrection is worthless. Number four, what if, 
from verse 15, our resurrection message is a lie. Number five, what if, found in verses 16 and 17, your faith is pointless and insane? Number six, what if, verse 17, you are still in your sins? And number seven, what if, verse 19, we have given up worldly pleasures for nothing? What if we don't rise from the dead? What was the problem here in the church of Corinth? Some preachers and teachers had convinced the Corinthians that their bodies would not rise from the dead. However, in verse 11, Paul had said to them, you believed our message that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. But then in verse 12, he says, they didn't believe that they would bodily rise from the dead. Why is this important? It's important for them. It's important for us. In Paul's day, Gnosticism invaded the church. Gnosticism is prevalent today. They believed your spirit would live after death, but your body wouldn't. The body was evil, but the spirit was pure. You could become saved. Your spirit is on its way to heaven, but your body can do whatever you jolly well please, and it didn't count. Isn't that wonderful? I can eat all the Snicker bars I want. <laughs> yes, sir. I can go to Vegas without any shame. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can do anything. It's all okay. Because it's the body sinning and not the spirit sinning. And the body, because it's sinful, doesn't have eternal life. But the spirit does. The Jews, now this was the Gentiles. And this message, this concept, was permeating the church. Now I said you. Gnosticism has invaded the church today, and it's the idea and the concept of whatever you think is right. You have imagined in your own mind something that you have gleaned from other teachers, and you have come up with an answer to all life's problems, and you got it together. I was thinking today of a fellow that used to come here that was hooked up with the um, Jehovah Witnesses, and he kept trying to tell us that we needed to work at our salvation or we wouldn't be saved. And he would argue over in the coffee shop with some of the best men. And I says, you absolutely think that the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus means nothing because you're the one saving yourself by your works. This was the Gentile movement. In the Jewish movement, they had a double-header problem. There were the Sadducees, as many of us have taken that word apart and said, they were sad, you see? <laughs> the reason they were sad, you see, is they didn't believe in eternal life at all. And you know, the, I don't remember how many of you remember the song, it was Doris Day sang it way back then. Okay, is this all there is? Is this all there is? Well, let's just go get drunk and have fun because this is all there is. Well, there was another one, okay, Sirrah, Sirrah, what will be, will be. And today we say, what it is, it is what it is. And same, same, same thing being said. The Sadducees would have sung those songs. The Pharisees believed in eternal life. And it's interesting that there was this big trial of Paul and before Felix, the governor, and he recognized that Felix had believed in and studied the, what teachings of the Pharisees who believed in a life after death. And he pointed at that and said, this is the reason why I am on trial today, because I believe in eternal life. The Pharisees believed that everyone will be raised from the dead at the very same time, and then body and spirit will be judged before God for your good works. So your works are what get you in. And so there is this scale. How good are you? How bad are you? How good are you? How bad are you? I, you know, what are you weighing down? I remember the story of a minister who was in the Middle East and he had gotten caught up in this. And during the week he would recognize the idea. Uh, it was, excuse me, it wasn't a minister, it was a deacon. And uh, he realized he had sinned that week and 
he needed to really repent before God. So instead of going to the church that was a half mile from his house, he went to one that was three miles from his house to pay penance because he knew that if he paid penance, he would be forgiven because he was more holy walking the three miles. You buy that? <laughs> you will be judged for your actions. And the Pharisees and the Jews believe this. Did you follow the feast days? Did you do the proper sacrifices? Did you bring the proper offerings? The Corinthians came down on the side of the Gnostics. They believed that Christians will spiritually live forever, but not in resurrected bodies. So this is the statement that Paul is making here. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, how come some of you are preaching that the dead do not rise? And he's talking about bodily. Paul tells them, if we don't rise from the dead, then neither did Jesus. But because he did, we also raise, he will also raise us up from the dead. Now, when he raised up Lazarus, did he just raise up his spirit or did he raise up his body? He raised up the, the whole boy. Yeah. And if I was Lazarus, I would have been said, you sure you want to do this? I was having a good time down there, you know? <laughs> the resurrection is not merely life after death. It isn't just life after this life. It's a continuation of the life that you have now. The life that you are living here. It's a transition. If you were picked up and plopped into the middle of London, England, it would be a total culture shock to you to find out how you need to talk and how you need to live and how you need to act, which is acceptable by them, but not really the thing that they want to see is people in Southern California running around tent wearing tennis shoes. They don't like that. Did you know that? Don't, don't, don't show up at a dinner wearing tennis shoes. They will dismiss you. Go away. And there's other things. A friend of uh, Della's uh, worked at the uh, the bank, and they always had a big potluck come 4th of July. And one of the wonderful things God put on the earth, corn on the cob. She wouldn't eat it coming from England. She said, that's what we feed the pigs. You need to cut that corn off of that. And she, she would need it. They said, oh, this is great southern food. She said, you can have my share. But it's a whole different culture. When we move into the life that Christ is preparing for us, it is a total culture shock. It is totally different than anything we have ever experienced here or ever will experience on this earth. Paul said a man went up to the third heaven and saw things that were not lawful to utter. And that statement that he's using there is, it wasn't possible to say it in the English language or in the Greek language. It wasn't in human tongue to be able to describe the glory and the beauty of heaven. That's what he was talking about. It is the continuation of our lives in a glorified body. What I said at the beginning, we shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We will have a glorified body like Jesus has. Our present bodies will be changed into a glorified state, just like the one Jesus has now. When we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As he is right now, he has scars in his hands and his feet and a hole in his side from the spear. It has been properly stated that the only thing that men have ever made are the, that will appear in heaven are the stars in Jesus' hands. That's the only thing that's going to be carried over from this earth into the next life. Recognize the concept that that divine spirit body he had before he was the incarnate son of God come down to earth, he gave it up. Whatever that glorious divine being of the Godhead Father, Jesus had that same existence and he gave it up so that he could come and save you and me. When he rose from the dead, he got a body that had never been seen before in the history of mankind. That body is the type of body you and I will have. Uh, this last weekend, I was uh, having a wonderful chat with one of my grandsons and he said he couldn't wait to get to heaven and have some wings so he could fly around. I said, hey buddy, you aren't going to need no wings when you get up there. 
You can do loop de loops and twirls and all kinds of stuff without no wings. You can absolutely do what you want. You can make all these roller coasters that down here on Earth look sick. Just go out and have a good old time. You don't need wings to do it. Really? And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> now imagine I'm one of these days we're going to get up there and we're going to see something streaking across the sky and it's going to be Gabriel. <laughs> Having a good old time. I'm going to let the glory roll when I, from thy name, is called in glory. I'm going to get beside myself when I get beside the king that day. Huh? I forget now the next, the next part of the verse. Um, huh? I'm going to, um, well, I'll think of it later. Uh, wonderful opportunity that we have before us because of what God is doing. I should have wrote it down before I said it. Sorry. <laughs> Gave their song. Paul tells us, whoops, did I, did I skip something? In Paul's day, okay, Gnosticism, Paul, the resurrection is not merely life after death, but a continuation of this life. What if there is no resurrection? Verses 14 through 19. If there is no resurrection, then Jesus is not risen. Paul and all the apostles are liars. Their false teaching is mere vanity. There is no real resurrected Jesus whom they serve. Worse, they are still dead in they and we are still dead in our sins. Paul's logic follows this point by point, following point number one. If there is no principle of the resurrection, then Jesus did not rise from the dead. Number two, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then death has power over him and has defeated him. Number three, if death has power over Jesus, he is not God. If Jesus, number four, is not God, he cannot offer a complete sacrifice for our sins. Number six, if Jesus cannot offer a complete sacrifice for sins, our sins are not completely paid for by God. Number, number seven, if my sins are not completely paid for before God, then I am still in my sins. And lastly, therefore, if Jesus is not risen, he is unable to save anyone. Everyone who has died believing in Jesus has perished. That word comes straight out of John 3.16. Those who believe in him will not perish. Moreover, we are the most miserable people on earth because we have bet everything on the wrong horse and we have lost. We gave up all the pleasures of this life in hopes of glorious afterlife for nothing. This whole Christian life is a pitiful joke. If I was 20 years old and able to have lots of fun, I would blaze a trail. Except for the fact that I think Jesus did rise from the dead. Giving up all of those pleasures and those opportunities to go wild and not have to pay for it. Sounds like what's going on today. Um, <laughs> get arrested and then get released the next day. Boy, you can't find any better than that, can you? It is bad. But imagine this if there is no responsibility for the things that you do. That's what he's talking about here. We believe that we are responsible before God. We believe that the things that we do, we're going to be judged for. The things that we say, we'll be judged for. The life that we live, we will be judged for. The purposes in our hearts, and our mind, the thoughts and the intents of our heart are going to be judged before God. We absolutely, totally believe that. And because we believe that, it causes us to change the way we live and act and talk. Martin Luther said, every doctrine totters on this one point, the resurrection of Jesus. Every other Christian teaching loses its value. C.H. Spurgeon said, it's all deceit and delusion. Josh McDowell, which I didn't put in the notes, no matter, now listen to me folks, you really got to listen to this. This is dynamite. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain that you will face, no matter how death stalks you or your loved ones, the resurrection of Jesus Christ promises you a glorious future 
an indescribable joy and an immeasurable peace with God forever. All because of the resurrection. What doctrines would we lose if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead? Number one, the divinity of Jesus rests on the resurrection. Romans chapter 1 verse 4, it is declared that the Son of God with power came forth by the resurrection. Number two, the sovereignty of Jesus rests on the resurrection. Romans 14 verse 9, Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. He is Lord over the dead and the living. He has supreme sovereignty. Number three, our justification rests on the resurrection of Christ. Romans 4.25, he was raised for your justification. You are justified by faith in that resurrection. Number four, our regeneration rests on the resurrection of Christ. 1 Peter 1.3, your hope, your grace of the future is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ at His resurrection who lives forever. Number five, our resurrection rests on the resurrection of Christ. Romans 8.11. Catch this, what Romans 8.11 says. The Spirit of Him, that's speaking of God, who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, listen, dwells in you. And He will also give life to your mortal bodies, eternal life, to live with God forever because of the resurrection of Christ. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Christ to come back from the dead will empower your body to come back to life. Verse 20 that we read when Paul summarized all the what-ifs, he said, but now, as things really are, this is from the Amplified Version, after saying all these what-ifs, let me talk to you about reality. Here's reality. Christ has, in fact, raised from the dead. And He became the first fruits, that is, the first to be resurrected with an incorruptible, immortal body, foreshadowing the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in death. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Spurgeon said, the silver thread of the resurrection runs through all God's blessings and binds them all together. John 14, because I live, you shall live also. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life now. When we meet Jesus, we will be brought to the Bema Seat, a platform where God hands out awards and rewards to all those who have followed Him and served Him, those who have loved Him. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead creates the greatest fact of history. It is that truth that defines all other truths. It is that doctrine that is found that is above all other doctrines and is the foundation of everything in Scripture and it is the capstone of history. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The foundation of everything and the capstone of everything is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the beginning. I am the end. In conclusion, yes, in conclusion, how about that matters? Huh? Told you, not an everlasting sermon. <laughs> When the Pharisees complained that Jesus should not perform miracles on the Sabbath day, he said, My Father has not never stopped working, and that is why I keep on working. John 5, 17. 
Jesus said the Sabbath day, the day of rest, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, Mark 2. Now listen, folks, God may have rested on the seventh day of, after creation, but he hasn't taken a day off since. God made the whole world and the universe in six days, and he made man and rested. Then he made woman, and nobody's rested since. <laughs> Uh, no paper wads are being thrown at me, so I guess I'm okay. <laughs> he is constantly working on our behalf. The promise in the Psalms to us is he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Sometime before midnight, I hope to put my head on the pillow and conk out. <laughs> God's not. He's going to be wide awake working on my prayers, thinking about my tomorrow, preparing the way, oiling the gates, and smoothing the road for me, for you. Paul told the church at Philippi, God is the one who began this good work in you, and I am certain that he won't stop before it is complete. But the Psalms tell us that our days on earth are numbered before we ever lived the first one. And God is working on our behalf to prepare us for an eternity with His Son. And God has said who He will give that eternity to. It is people who trust in His Son. Who believe in Him as the Son of the living God. Those who don't, God will not share His heaven with them. Or one preacher often say, hey, John Hickey, why do people want to go to heaven if they don't want to go to God's house? <laughs> Half the people that used to go to church don't go anymore because of the excuse of COVID. They've gotten into the habit of not coming. They're not coming at all. Book of Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, even as you see the day approaching, talking about judgment, talking about the rapture. And it says in chapter 10, the Lord is coming for those who look for His return. That's a scary thought. If you're not looking for the soon return of Jesus Christ, oh, you might not get to see Him. That's scary. I would think that it would be good for us to remember that the beginning of wisdom, Solomon said, is the fear of the Lord. He's an awful God but he's an awfully good God, too. Many of us wonder when God is going to do something about the mess that's going on in our world. i got news for you. God is waiting on you. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 18, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Who does the binding first? You. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Who does the loosening? You. The initiative rests with you and me. Friends, the ball is in our court and God is waiting on us to trust Him, believe Him, and to proclaim His Word. Elijah came into the court of Ahab and Jezebel and said, ain't going to rain no more, no more until I say so. Toodles. And walked out. And God shut up the heavens. And you know what? That in Scripture it had been written for 1,500 years that when the people fell into idol worship, He would shut up the heavens and stop the rain. And it was still happening. It was still falling. The people were worshiping idols and sinning. But it hadn't stopped raining. Elijah looked at a verse of God and said, I'm going to lay my body down and believe this verse more than I believe what's going on. And walked into Ahab's court and said, this is what's going to happen. i got news for you. This is going to shock you. It shocked us. Elijah was not a Jew. He was not an Israelite. He was a son of Abraham through Ishmael. He was a son of Ishmael. A Tishbite. Not of the twelve tribes. 
He believed God when God's people wouldn't believe God. And God honored his name and said, I am going to send men into the midst of my people who will declare my name and my word to the world that are not part of the group, not part of the cloistered little acceptable peers. And they're going to rattle the cages of the church and the world by declaring my word and my name, even in spite of the face of torture, torment, and death. And that's what Elijah did, and that's what we need today, men and women who will stand up for God without fear and favor of men. When you pray, here's the promise. Isaiah 58, 9. I will answer. Call on me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you know not. Jeremiah 33. In John 16, ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. Another translation says, you don't have any joy, because you haven't been asking in my name. Ask in my name, and your joy will be full. Matthew 18, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Last I checked, a husband and a wife make two. A sister and a sister, a brother and a brother make two. You have the ability when you take the hands of a loved one to bring the presence of the living God into your midst and the Holy Spirit empowering your prayer will shake the heavens and bring about the answer for which you seek God to perform in this day. You can have it in Jesus' name. You can have it. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. Huh? You give me a rest of it? May... The Spirit of God be with you until we meet again. May He keep you in the hollow of His hand. For the Lord is with you. And He will keep you. In Jesus' name. God bless you, everybody. I'll be back in two weeks. Next week is Pastor Paul. I'll be back on the 20th with another patch. Y'all come and watch. You see me with another patch. It's going to be fun. God bless you, everybody.